Lemonada. I love singing. I took singing lessons, voice lessons, all through middle and upper school. I was in the glee club. I was a really good mezzo-soprano, and I always loved singing in a group. I still do. When I was pretty little, uh, junior high, I think, we had a big voice recital with a sizable audience, you know, and I was meant to sing two songs, two solos in the recital. The first one was one of those awful Victorian parlor songs called Bendemir's Stream. I had spent many months rehearsing it, and on opening night, I got on stage and I started to sing. There's a bower of roses by Bendemir's stream. And the next line goes, And the nightingale sings round it all the day long. But I never got to that second line, okay? Because my mind went totally blank and I couldn't remember anything. So I just kept repeating that line. There's a bower of roses on Bendemir's stream. There's a Bower of Roses by Bendemir Stream over and over for the rest of the <laughs> song. I am telling you, it was so awful. I'm making myself sick telling this story. It was the first time I'd ever experienced anything like that, a real, truly botched performance. And I mean, I love to perform, but I just froze, man. It was devastating. But here's the deal. See, I still had to sing my other song which was Far From the Home I Love from Fiddler on the Roof. And I'm going to tell you something. It was the most magnificent performance I have ever given because I was so upset about fucking up Bendemir's stream. I was bawling (laughs) the entire time I was singing my second song, Far from the home I love. How can I hope to make you understand why I do what I do? And I'm weeping and I'm weeping. Far from the home I love. And tears are just like running down my cheeks. I could barely get words out, but the tune was coming. And I mean, I'm telling you, everybody was cheering. They think I'm a musical theater genius who can, on command, summon the emotions needed for Fiddler on the Roof. So that's what happens to me singing in front of people. I go blank. I don't get it. Okay. I love singing. I love music. I have a pretty decent voice. I really do. But this has happened to me now a number of times, only in front of people, okay? I'm fine in a studio or in a group, but when there are a lot of people, God damn it! (sighs) So I work with the NRDC, which is the Natural Resources Defense Council, and recently there was this big NRDC event, and Carol King was performing, and I was hosting or something, and Carol King had the idea that I should come out with Jewel, actually, and we would all sing a couple of stanzas of This Land is Your Land together. Okay, so I'm standing off stage. I'm holding the microphone, ready to come out and sing with the glorious Carol King, which is a dream come true, of course. And right before I went out, I got so frightened, I suddenly developed a fever, easily 102. And I remember thinking, wow, My God, I have a proper fever. You know, I'm sweating, I'm shaking. I had this horrible high fever. And out I go with Jewel. And I swear to you, I don't remember a goddamn thing. Nothing. I blacked out. My husband tells me it went great. But I mean, seriously, I have absolutely no reason to believe him. Uh, So I tell all of these stories on myself, not just to scare away musical producers. And I do want to say that I think with a little rehearsal, you guys, and perhaps some medication, I would absolutely figure this out. But I bring it up because it's ironic. Because to me, there's nothing more joyful in the world than singing, than music. And I wish there were a way I could be a part of a glee club again. I mean, that'll never happen. I often thought maybe I should join a church so I could sing in the choir, but I really, honestly, I don't want to join a church or a choir. But I would like to be able to sing. I think it's just the most human, primal, wonderful thing. And when you hear a great singer, oh my 
God, you can't believe what you're hearing. It's just transcendent. Any kind of singer, an opera singer, a jazz singer, a rock and roll singer, when it's good, it's magic. And for me, what really tops it all is gospel and soul. There is nothing like it. And that's why today I'm talking to Darlene Love. Hi, I'm Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and this is Wiser Than Me, a show where each week I get schooled by women who are wiser than me. Can you imagine being in the studio singing with Elvis Presley and Sam Cooke and Dionne Warwick, the Beach Boys, and Aretha Franklin? Sharing the stage with Tom Jones and the boss himself, Bruce Springsteen? And being the singer that even Mariah Carey calls the real queen of Christmas? How about being one of Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Singers? That's Darlene Love. When I saw the documentary 20 Feet from Stardom, which so beautifully captures the triumphs and hardships of some of the most important yet most unknown voices in pop music, I made it a bucket list item to meet and talk to the one and only Darlene Love. I've stalked her on Instagram ever since, and she can rock the hell out of a red jumpsuit. She spent six decades being an artist in the roughest of all of the arts, popular music. She's made spectacular art in an industry that is exceptionally brutal and has always undervalued women of color. She's a mother, an author, and a rock and roll hall of famer. She's been through it all, and she's still standing and still singing. She's Darlene Love, and she is so much wiser than me. Welcome, wonderful Darlene. Hi there. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so glad to see you. Hey, are you comfortable if I say your real age? Oh, everybody else does. (laughs) Go right ahead. Tell me, what is it? I will be 82 in a few months. July, I'll be 82. (laughs) Well, happy birthday in advance. How old do you feel? Do you feel... Your age? You know what? I feel younger than my children, and my oldest son is 62. I'm looking at you. I have to say, what deal have you made with the devil? You look (laughs) so incredible. Not with him. That's who I don't make no deals with. (laughs) No. (laughs) So do you love being your age? I really do. I didn't feel my age until my son turned 60. Yes, I went like, when did you turn 60? How did that happen? Yeah. (laughs) But I don't feel my age, and I don't think I ever have because I've never had a problem with age. I feel as good or if not better than I did when I was like in my 20s and 30s. No kidding. Why is that? I think it's because... I have so much energy, but I was always like my father. My father was a minister, and he was Mm -hmm. always on time and always, come on, you guys, I'm waiting on you. I'm ready to go. When I wake up in the morning, I do everything in a hurry, Mm -hmm. and I've always been like that, and I think that's what it is, and I still have that same get up and go. Everybody has trouble <laughs> keeping up with me. Even my husband, he says, let's go for a walk. But when I say let's go for a walk, I don't mean a little trot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's walk. <laughs> yeah. So you're physically active. Yes. I still get up at 530 in the morning and do a kickboxing class four days a week. Really? Yes. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> and I'm the oldest one in the class. Of and course. My, the class are adult ladies who Mm -hmm. are physically in pretty good shape. And I think I'm at least 20 years older than everybody in the class. But now everybody's just trying to keep up with me. I love that. All right, you guys. (laughs) You know what I think? I think Marvel should put you in the Marvel universe. I think you should be a superhero. (laughs) I do. That would be fun. Yes. It would be incredible. (laughs) So who is a gospel superhero for you? I mean, you started in gospel when you were basically a kid, right? 
I knew everything there was about gospel because we grew up gospel. I was with Aretha Franklin when she was 16 years old, traveling with her father. We went to the churches to hear her sing, you know what I'm saying, with, when her dad was there. So we knew about Aretha Franklin. Were you in awe of her voice? From day one. Yeah. But I never thought she, now listen to this one, I never thought she'd be a successful secular singer. Why? I just didn't think she wanted to be. Or it was something about her that she and her head wanted to stay in gospel. Because how we were all grew up, you know what I'm saying? You use your voice for the Lord. Right. That's who you should be singing for. And all of those kind of make you not want to jump over. But I have two of my greatest people that I love who were gospel singers, Aretha Franklin and Sam Cooke. I mean, you don't get no better than that. No, you certainly do not. He came straight out of gospel and went into secular music. Uh huh. You know what I'm saying? Aretha didn't. She slowly got into secular music because she was, was with her father. That was probably a heavier cross than she knew she was going to have to bear because church people just have this thing in them about who you should work for. But I knew I was not going to be a gospel singer. I knew I was going to be a secular singer when nobody else knew it. Plus, I came from a background, uh, what we call Pentecostal, where they did not listen to that kind of music. They call that the devil's music. Mm-hmm. And my father was a bishop in the organization. We had so much respect for our parents back in those days. Yes. I wouldn't, didn't really want to go against what he said or didn't want to go against what he believed. Mm-hmm. But he also believed that it was nothing really wrong with what I was doing. Mm-hmm. But the organization, it's just like any kind of organization that you would, you have to go along with what they say and what they do and how they do it. Well, my father was the same way. So he could not just openly saying, you can sing rock and roll music if you want to. Just go ahead on out there and do it. But he would say that privately. Go ahead, sweetheart. You can do it. And what about your mom? Was she a little more hesitant for you to do this? Yes, because my mother was a missionary in church. She was the first lady. Mm -hmm. You know, so she had to be more reserved than my father. Let me tell you something. I really believe this. God help me. (laughs) But the man is going to always do what he wants to do. Yeah. Whether he's the preacher, whether he's the pastor, whether whatever he is. But the woman always has to be in her place. In second position. Yes. It's gotten a hundred times better today than it ever was. But back in the day, they were like looked on as somebody that just sit in church with their hand gloves on, with their little hat on, and their person just sit there and be cute and not say anything. I know that you had two marriages that ended in divorce, and given the fact that you came from this community, was that particularly difficult? Oh, I was going straight to hell. Oh, gosh, really? (laughs) If your husband is still alive, you cannot remarry. And were your parents supportive? My father used to say to me, when I said, well, I guess I'm going to hell because I'm getting remarried. He said, don't you ever say that again. You're not going to go to hell because you remarried. Wow. So once he said that, whether he said it to me in confidence or when we were just having a personal conversation, that stuck with me. I'm not going to hell because I'm, I am I remarried. Oh, uh, we had a pastor one time that would say, well, what I should have did was kill the old girl and because they'll forgive you that and then marry somebody else afterwards. No. <laughs> well, they'll forgive you for murder, but they won't forgive you for ma- remarrying. That's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Boy, we have your daddy to thank for a lot. I yes, can feel we do. It. Yes, we do. <laughs> what a great man. Yes, yes, yes. They even, when I was working with Tom Jones as a backup singer and with Dionne Warwick as a backup singer in Las Vegas, my mother and father would come to those shows. They wouldn't tell anybody they were there, but they came to those shows to see their daughter. They were very proud of me, the things that I was doing. And let's see, the thing about background, I loved singing background. That was so breathtaking for me to be a background singer for Elvis and for, oh. you know, Tom Jones and Dion. I worked for Dion Work for 10 years. My goodness. So being around her was like great for me to see a superstar work and what her habits were. You know what I'm saying? So, but I saw all that and I admired her from, you know, from a distance. Because when I got with her, she was still climbing. 
She had reached her goal, but she was still, you know, still things she wanted to do. You know, she was a, a champion of doing what a woman, she thought a woman should be able to do, you know, mm -hmm. uh, beyond where they think you should go. Because a lot of times in our career, they think, okay, you can have a little success, but wait a minute now, you can't get ahead of us. Who's us? The men, men in our business, uh -huh. you know, they controlled everything. Yeah. You know, they made you who you, they were the producers and the directors and all of those people in our business. Well, most of them still are. Still, I know. Did she give you advice, specific career advice, Dion? The one thing she told me one time, don't let people stop you from being who you are. Mm-hmm. And I always remember that. You know, because there were a lot of people that, you know, well, you're a background singer, but you could never be a solo artist, you know, and why not? I still have a, the solo voices in me. I just enjoy doing background. It was wonderful because I got to see what happens like in the movie, 20 Feet from Stardom. You see everything. I know everything. you really do <laughs> everything. And you see, you know, it, it's something that I want to talk to you about because in the movie, I'm so struck well, let me tell you a couple things I'm struck by. First of all, the scene in the movie when you sing Lean on Me and the camera catches you because you're a very ebullient, cheerful. I, I mean, when I'm picking up, you emanate positivity. You have a smile on your face. But when you're singing that song, I see you pulling from a deep place. And that's why your performance is so gut-wrenchingly wonderful, I think. That's so true. Because you're not afraid to go there as a performer, and it's breathtaking to me, mm -hmm. breathtaking. And the messaging of that song is sort of, in a lot of ways, the messaging of the movie, Lean On Me, when you're not strong, and talking about all these background singers who have big dreams, mm. and some of them fall shy of those dreams, and have to reconcile that. And I think that's really, because we both know, I certainly know in my career, plenty of people who didn't quite get what they want. Mm -hmm. And maybe they got some of what they want, but maybe not the whole thing. And it's so wonderful how life has worked out for you and that you came to stardom at the age of 40 and you've just been going ever since. But we know these people both of us, that haven't had that kind of success. And I wonder, what do you say to them? I'm curious. Like, can you talk about that a little bit for people who, I don't know, they have to ad ad adapt? You have to be so strong, but also you have to be kind. Yeah. I don't know about everybody else, but I felt I had to be strong and let people know I am strong in what I do on who I am and what I feel, but I also have to be kind too. I don't want to yeah. strangle them no. to make them know this. I want them to see the kindness you have to have too. Our business is so hard. I said, so hard. Be an entertainer, being a preacher, or being the president are three things you better be ready for. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing easy about any of those. Mm -hmm. You know, you go through. People telling you you've gotten too old. I mean, no, you got kids now. You need probably be, need to be home now with your family. Well, but I said I haven't gotten to where I want to be yet. I still have time. I'm still alive. I want what I want because I have it in me to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you like to sing harmony? Oh, I love it. Yes, I love it. You have a total ear for it, do you not? I mean, in totally. other words, you can harmonize without batting an eye. Honey, we used to laugh at Sonny Bono, who was one of my greatest friends, one of my greatest mm -hmm. champions. Man, you are tone deaf, but I can harmonize with you. <laughs> <laughs> and we had so much fun at sessions. Like when I was working with Elvis, it was just fun to be around him because he wanted to be one of you. Yeah. He didn't want to be Elvis. He just wanted to be like a background singer with you guys, you know. And most of the yeah. time it was with gospel songs. And Elvis liked what we call the hymns of the church, you know, the old mm -hmm. songs. You mm -hmm. know, uh, bless precious Lord, take my hand, 
lead me on, let me stand. And he loved all those songs. So he would go, do you know this one? He couldn't play it on the piano or the guitar, but he'd get one of his dads, play this song, you know. And we would stay up all night, half the night, singing all these wonderful songs. By the way, you know, I was watching that special, the comeback special that you're on with yes. the Blossoms. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, the way you, the three of you women, negotiated those stairs, do you remember this? <laughs> yes. On the set, c- coming down behind him. Right. And you did not look down. Oh, no. And you had heels on. <laughs> right. You had heels on. And that was that was like an Olympic athlete move, going down those stairs, singing, not falling. I was, I was nervous thinking, oh, please don't trip. Please don't trip. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. We did that about 10 or 15 times time so you know by the time so you, you had to do it, it that yeah, many yeah. times and you do look at first you know but after a while of course you could feel that where the next step was going to be because it was with yes. the beat and we weren't supposed to be seen in that special just sing and not be you know sing not seen oh really because it was a choir also along with us when we were doing the background That's right. but elvis went to the producer and said oh no 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 i want the girls in this scene with me no kidding he asked for us to be in that scene So I thought that was great, too. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It was a lot of things that we did with with stars that no other background singers did or got a chance to do. Like what else? You know, we I mean, working with um, Sam Cooke was wonderful. He came by my high school and picked me up and took me to a recording session with him that we were doing that day. He did not. Me and my girlfriend is only one of us just still alive, just two of us. And we talk about that the other day, talking about, remember that time he came, we went by your school and picked you up from school? And I was telling everybody at school, guess who's picking me up after school? <laughs> of course, they didn't believe it till they saw it. Because he, he was already see, he was already Sam Cook at that point, Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, he had already had you send me right. because we recorded, we're on Everybody Likes the Cha-Cha-Cha. Right. Everybody Likes, likes the Cha-Cha-Cha. Yeah. So we didn't, we were, and, you know, he had already had you send me, you know, so, he, you know, just the whole idea it was Sam Cook. It's, you got to be kidding, you know. So we had a lot of wonderful times with the stars that we were working with and became friends with them. Even today, Dion and I are still very close because our children were the same age. That's what made it really great because she could bring her kids on the road so mine could come along too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of course you're close because you guys were similarly driven and also mothers and on the road. I mean, yep. that kind of overlap doesn't happen frequently in life. That's amazing. And how lucky for you. No, you don't actually... Being successful does not happen when you start off that way because it's hard. It's really hard. You have to really believe you can do it and and it's going to happen with you. I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know. I tell the Lord a lot of time, I didn't think you're going to work till I got 45 to get this career moving. (laughs) (laughs) But here we are, and I'm still really enjoying it. Really am. (laughs) It's time for a quick break, but don't worry, there's more with Darlene Love in just a bit. Everything is better al fresco, am I right? Warm summer nights means you can do all of your favorite things, but outdoors. Whether you're sharing a meal, having some drinks, or watching a movie, nothing beats being outdoors with loved ones. There's no better way to host those friends and family than with Article's outdoor furniture sets. Article is an online furniture store with beautifully designed pieces featuring mid-century modern, coastal, Scandinavian, and boho designs that makes furniture shopping simple and affordable. I love how simple it is to browse and filter for your furniture needs and have each item delivered right to your door. Designing an outdoor space of your dreams is one of the best ways to ensure you'll want to spend time outside this summer. An article has made it so easy to shop for your outdoor living needs by creating bundles that are pre-styled for any living space. They even have a great outdoor nap bundle. Picture a beautiful sofa bed, side table, and outdoor rug, all in orange hues that reflect the sunset. 
Article is offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash wiser, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash wiser for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. We all love to talk about our hair, and people ask me about mine all the time. I often use the opportunity to talk about how we can protect the environment through our shampoo choices. Eco-conscious is the new glamorous. And how great is it when you find a brand like Hair Story that is both eco-conscious and glamorous? They know that traditional shampoo is actually not great for your hair, and the impact of shampoo bottles on the environment isn't either. Hair Story is best known for its hero product. New Wash, the first of its kind custom formula that cleans, conditions, detangles, and restores hair without harsh foams and damaging detergents found in traditional shampoos. The luxurious result, your healthiest, happiest hair ever. Also, Hair Story donates 1% of their 8-ounce new wash sales to water-related issues. I love brands that can show their commitment to the environment in really tangible ways. Plus, new wash is 100% biodegradable and comes in 100% recyclable pouch packaging, helping you avoid contributing to the 500 million plastic shampoo bottles that are discarded each year. I love knowing that the company is doing what's best, not just for hair health, but also for the environment. We could all be more conscious of what we're buying, and shampoo is no exception. Try New Wash. Have your best hair day every day and support the environment by going to hairstory.com. Plus, if you use code WISER at checkout, Hair Story will donate 10% to water preservation efforts and you'll enjoy 20% off your purchase. That's hairstory.com. Use code WISER. You know that feeling when you try on a new article of clothing and it just checks all of the boxes? It's that new sweater, that new pair of jeans or those shoes that somehow just does something different for you. When I find a brand that knows how to pull off that delicate balance of effortless and put together, I'm a fan for life. Let me tell you about a little secret in women's apparel that you've maybe never heard of that will become your new go-to place to shop. EverEve is a retailer of women's apparel, accessories, and footwear, thoughtfully curated for fashion-forward women who are older and wiser. They have 96 stores across 33 states and offer an easy-to-use online store that you can browse for ages. One of the best ways to browse Ever Eve's site is to visit their Shop the Formula site, which has put together looks pre styled with links to every item on their site. You can grab your top, shoes, and accessories all in one go. It's such a fun and easy way to visualize a look and then grab all the pieces you need, whether you're shopping for an upcoming vacation, a summer wedding, or more. So go to evereve.com and you'll see what I mean about their online experience. I mean, wait a minute, don't do it right now. I'm still talking. But after you're done listening to this podcast, then go visit Ever Eve to experience it yourself. Check out Ever Eve's latest curated styles and get 20% off your first online order when you use promo code WISER at evereve.com. That's Ever Eve, E V E R E V E. Dot com. Promo code WISER. Talk about raising boys and having your career. And I heard the story when you had to take other jobs, when you're working in California, this is before you moved to New York, and you were a housekeeper. And you had your boys then, right? You had all three boys at that point? I had all three boys, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved my boys. They were, they were beautiful. My, my, my last baby boy, he was the biggest one I had. He was 10 pounds. Okay, pull over. <laughs> what are you saying? He ten was 10 pounds. pounds, yes. And he was the biggest, but I had big babies. My first child was 7 pounds. 14 ounces. Yes. And then my middle one was six pounds, eight ounces. So I had big boys. And you know how your doctor will tell you, you know, you're going to have a big, big child here. You're just... And then I didn't know it was going to be 10 pounds. 10 pounds. That's a lot of baby to get out. That's a two month old baby. You definitely need to go into the Marvel universe. You are a superhero. <laughs> 
You do. Well, you know what? And I loved my boys. They never, they didn't give me trouble until they got older and would find it out about drugs and, you know, hanging out. And mm. and it, it got a little loose. That one thing almost made me stop singing because I felt that I should be home, you know, trying to help them get through this. But I always say God didn't let me mm -hmm. because I needed to do that for me. You can only help your kids so much. When you have taught them, like I feel they were brought up the right way, whatever the right way is for every parent. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought I had did. All I know to do to keep them on the right track. And then Who as, was supporting you? Did you have your mom? Was anybody helping you with them? My mom and my dad for a long time. That's nice. But then I had to have the people, they came in to live with me, a housekeeper who came to help me with the boys. And then the fathers left because I got a divorce and there was just me, the housekeeper, and the boys. Yes. You know, still had my mother and father too. They were big champions for me for taking care of my boys. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to go through my sons going to prison. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. One of my sons uh, went to prison for 12 years. Oh, my. They were on that three-strike rule in California. Oh. No matter what you did. you And most of the times it was about a, a, a weed, marijuana. You know, it wasn't like they killed somebody or they murdered somebody. It was weed. <laughs> And this is while you're having your career? Yes, exactly. Wow. Only people that really knew that were those who were close to me, like Dion Warwick knew, Tom uh -huh. Jones knew. Uh -huh. So we were all together as a family because everybody was having trouble with their children. You know what I'm saying? So they offered support. They were emotionally supportive to you? Very. You know, it's going to mm -hmm. be okay. Do you need time off? You know, you want to go home. Uh, mm -hmm. I did go home for a little while, but that didn't help. You know, it just made me more, what's the word? Anxious? Yes. To, I can't yes. do anything to help him. I can't get through with this. Tell me, is he okay now? All of them are. They're great right now. That's what I mean. You yes. know, like, That's so they good. strayed, but they also came back. You know, they came back. prison didn't get in them. And that's the most important thing. Because if they don't have a life to come to after they come out, they usually go back in. Mm -hmm. But they had support from me, their father's. Even though we were divorced, they still had their father. You know, he, he took care of them, too. Mm -hmm. And my mother and father. Thank God, they, the last time they came out, they never went back in. Mm -hmm. So they're great guys. You know, uh, both of my sons uh, have their own business. You know, my baby son was a school teacher. You know, and, it, you know, life has, now life is paying me off because I'm very comfortable about everything that's going on with my children. Matter of fact, they come and help me in my business. My son comes and drives uh, with the flying, everything, especially now with the flying. I'm not so crazy about flying because of the, the yes. pandemic and everything. Yeah. He comes here because my work is usually at Christmas time. Uh -huh. Of course. That's when I work nonstop. But that's the only thing I've slowed down doing. <laughs> Instead of doing five shows without a day off, I have a day off before and a day off after. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you still have to try to use a little sense about this. You know, I want to do it, but I want to do it 100%. So I definitely have to take care of myself physically. But you did, you did have a heart attack. Can you tell us about that and what adjustments you've made in your life, if you have, since having had the heart attack? I'm a junk eater. Mm. I'm a chocoholic. Yeah. Snickers, any of the worst candy you can think of. Mm -hmm. I remember, which each of my children, I ate a different candy. <laughs> like, I, I, yeah, it was crazy. You mean when you were pregnant? Is that yeah, what you when mean? I was pregnant, yes. Uh huh. And I would eat Snickers. I don't mean I had one Snicker and then I didn't have any for three or four days. I mean, I had three and four Snickers a day. Oh, my God. I bought them by the, the box, like 24 in a box. <laughs> I get to really? know everybody in my grocery store. And I, I started, I think what really did it is when I started drinking Carmel Macchiatas. <laughs> I was doing hairspray. On Broadway, and yeah. the place was right down the street where you could go get them, right? Yeah. So every day, I would go and get one every day, and on Wednesdays and Saturdays, I had two. Because you had two shows. So for almost three years, I had that every day I worked. Wow. 
And I think that's what gave me the heart attack. It finally, over the years of eating all the candy and all the sweets. Sugar. And all, all of that sugar. And I, the thing about it, when I had the heart attack, I didn't even know I was having it. I was on my way to work. And you continued to perform while having it. Am I right? Yes. That night, yeah, my husband, thank God, he was in touch with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yes. And told him to stop and get an aspirin. Mm. He gave me the aspirin. I chewed it. The pain went away. I went to work, did the show, stayed at the show, signed autographs, took pictures, the whole bit. And that night, uh, I said, yeah, me and my husband was talking about the pain because I'd never had that kind of pain before. Wait a minute. What kind of pain was it that you were feeling? <sighs> a stabbing pain. Where? Right smack dab exactly where your bra, if you have on a wire bra, where it meets, yes. that's exactly where it was. Got it. Uh, and I was sick all day. I had a stomach ache. Right. They're telling you years ago, if you're having a heart attack, it's your arm or whatever. Yeah. By the way, I just want to point something out. Those are symptoms for men who are having a heart attack. Yes. Women having a heart attack, their symptoms present differently. And I love that that was... You know, the push, everybody understood, well, I'm not having pain in my arm, so I'm fine, I'm fine. It's just a stomach ache or it's a cramp. Yes. Right? It was an uncomfortable feeling. Like you wanted to, to, to whatever you had in your Throw stomach, up. you wanted it to yeah. come, come out. And yes, yes. Um, that, that's what I was having all day. Anything I would eat, even water, would want to come back up. Wow. Went to the doctor the next day. I still didn't have any pain. But when he hooked me up to everything, he knew I was having a heart attack. He said, you sure you're not feeling anything? I said, I feel no pain. I don't feel anything. So when he sent me to the, the, the specialist, which was literally right across the hall, he said, did you come by yourself? I said, no, my husband brought me. He said, go home, get a bag. I will meet you at the hospital at 10. We will be operating on you at 12. And I'm going, what? Wait a minute. What's going on? Now I really want to have a heart attack because what, what are you talking about here? This is not how you have a heart attack. I mean, you, I got to call my, my sister, my children. I got to call my pastor. I got to, you know, to let them know I'm going into the hospital because I'm having a heart attack. Wow, wow, wow. That quick. You know, I think your husband might have saved your life with that aspirin. Oh, no, he did. No, no, no. The doctor said your husband saved your life. But now you've been married for many decades, correct? Yes, 38 years. Well done, you. Well, you know what? I, I told Cher, I told I said, listen, I had to do three times to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> so what'd you get right? Give us some tips. Tell me how you've done it. What's right about this? Really? You know what happened? I met him on the cruise ship. Mm -hmm. This is when my life was in one of them struggling things. You know what? Okay, I'm really tired. When is this going to happen? I know it's going to happen for me, but I'm still struggling. And I met my third husband. He was the chief steward on board the Carnival Cruise Line. Was it love at first sight? No, I liked him. I said, oh, he's kind of cute. Mm -hmm. You know, he has beautiful brown eyes. Anyway... What made us really get together? He ignored me. <laughs> oh, really? And I said, I'm not having this. <laughs> <laughs> so you did you make the first move? Yes. He hates me to tell this story because he doesn't want anybody to think he didn't make the first move. I said, no, I made the first move. I said, what's wrong with you? Don't you like me? <laughs> but then you're older now, so you don't really care. You know, I wasn't looking no. for no man. I wasn't looking for uh, it. Was my my career was on now? It's forget y'all. The kids are grown mm -hmm. now. Y'all got your life. It's all about mom now, and I'm mm -hmm. going to get it. So I really wasn't interested in in finding anybody, and he just snuck right in. And then, how soon after that? Like, how long did you court? And then what happened? For when did a you... year and a half, we started dating in '83. We got married in '84 moved to New York, and my career took off. So the stars aligned for you right then. Both ways, for my husband, for my married personal life, yes, and for my career, because this husband that I'm married to now understood what I was doing. And he was interested in me getting my career where I He knew where I was. I was having a hard time getting my career mm -hmm. going. 
And with Mm -hmm. him, he wanted to help me build. He was your champion. Yes, he wanted to help me build my career. Just like your dad. I like that. Exactly, exactly. Hello there, Wiser Than Mirrors. Uh, It's Julia jumping in here. Okay, so at this point, we realize that Darlene's microphone was actually moving around a lot, which is kind of ironic because of all the amazing guests we've had on this show. Darlene Love is by far the best with a microphone, obviously. So uh, please bear with this shitty audio for the next couple of minutes. Thanks. I think we have to pause because there's an issue with your mic, I'm being told. I think that's what's going chat. on, and I don't know what yeah. it is. If we give me like uh, three minutes here to just Three minutes to move. set it, because I think they want to fix it so it will stop moving. Where are you, though? Where, I'm, I'm in uh, uh, Rockland County, New York. Oh, New York. And where are you? I'm in Santa Barbara, California. Oh, I know exactly where that is. Yeah. Because I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I know you were. <laughs> Do you miss it? Not at all. <laughs> uh huh. I did it first because I I never liked New York. I never liked at, back east. Mm-hmm. I loved working here, but I never mm-hmm. thought I would live here. So what made you make that change? I tell this story to Stevie Van Zandt every time I see him. You are the reason I live in New York. <laughs> Really? <laughs> he saw me at a show in California, and he mm-hmm. said, I want you to come to New York. I want to record you. Him and Bruce uh, had just finished doing something, and they saw my show, and uh, he said, well, if I get you a job, would you come? I went, sure, give me a job. I'll come. He got mm-hmm. me two jobs, actually, and I came here, and I found out I had a life here, a, a career here, because I'd never worked here as Darling Love. I mainly just worked here as a backup singer, you know, for all the people that I've worked with, mostly the beginning of my career. I didn't start my solo career until I turned 40. So I say, I tell these people, don't even worry about age if you got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I hope that we can, I don't know if, are we recording all of this still, even though, wait a minute. Uh, yes. Yep, we're okay. recording. Good. I want to make sure, because... <laughs> Nobody it's, believes what we go through. You know, know. they think you just turn a button. <laughs> and then it's done. And you have all these geniuses working behind the scenes. Okay. I think we're in way better shape now. Thank you so much for your help. So you were talking about how the reason you live in New York is because of Stevie Van Zant, right? Yes. And could, do you mind telling that story and how it is you're in New York and how this happened to you in your career? And then we'll go back. So I'm, I'm coming I'm coming at your career sort of uh, through the back door and then coming the back, back to the front. Because <laughs> yeah. literally, you know, I tell my husband all the time, you know, literally my career started here in New York mm-hmm. because I had never worked in New York before as Darling Love. And I worked at this club called The Bottom Line. That's where Stevie Van Zandt got me my first job, which I loved. So I got to know the manager and everybody that works there. So it was wonderful. And how old were you? Then? 40. 40. 40 years old. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why I say, listen, it's never too late. Don't let people t- talk to you about age. If you still yeah. got it, if you can still sing, if you still have that energy, don't worry about it. People, they'll come along with you eventually because yeah. that's actually what happened uh, in New York. Alan Pepper, who owned the club, started putting newspaper articles in. Darling Love is working tonight. She'll be here through Wednesday or Thursday, whatever. So the press started coming to my shows. I see. And that's literally how it happened. Now, you figure for 30, almost 40 years ago, the press wasn't anything like they are today. <laughs> Right. You know, this is pre-Twitter, pre-everything. Yep. Pre-social media. Right. So there was a lady, you might know her. I love her. Her name was Sue Simmons. Oh, yes, of course, She used to course, do what Sue's... we call Live at Five. Live at Five. Right. I know it well because I was working at 30 Rock at the time. Ah, yes. Was it Chuck Scarborough, Yes, too? Chuck Scarborough. He's still on. That's right. Matter of fact. Yeah. I know. It's can like, you imagine? I'm, and he no, looks good. No, I cannot. Yes, he does. He hasn't changed. In fact, I remembered I was in New York and I saw him and I on television. I was like, 
wow, he's like, this is like a time machine or something. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I remember Sue Simmons well. She actually retired, but during this time, she would always have me on her show like I was her next door neighbor. Come on down and be on the show. Or I'd be, I was doing the David Letterman show then. Mm. So we were like next door to one another. So whenever I'd go to do David's show, I'd just pass by Sue and just say, hey, what's going on with... And she started sending people down to the show to see me. She said, you got to see this lady. She's crazy. It's, it's unbelievable at her age what she's doing. I was doing two shows a night. When you worked at the bottom line back then, you did an 8 o'clock and a midnight show. Oh. So she started sending people down. Then the press started coming to see me. So they started talking about Darling Love. And the more I worked there, the more people. You know, the first couple of shows I did were like kind of spacey, you know, wasn't a whole lot of people there. I think that room holds like 300 people. Yeah. But by the time I finished working, you couldn't get into the show. Really? Really. It's just amazing how my career took off when I got to New York. Yeah. We'll be back with Darlene Love right after this quick break. This show is brought to you by Osea. Osea makes me so proud to live on the coast, so close to the ocean. Osea's incredible fan favorite product, the Ocean Eyes Serum, is made from seaweed that was harvested sustainably right here in California. It's safe for your skin and for the environment. Okay, something I really love about Osea is this list I'm about to read for you. Ready? All of Osea's ocean-inspired and infused products are clean, vegan, cruelty-free, climate-neutral, powered by seaweed, and conceived in California. Osea is just truly transparent about everything they do, from their ingredients to their practices. For over 27 years, Osea has been a woman-founded, family-owned business committed to making a difference, one fresh new look at a time. They want to make sure you never have to choose between your values and your best skin ever. Spring into your most radiant skin yet with clean, vegan skincare and body care from Osea and get 10% off your first order site-wide with code WISER at oseamalibu.com. You get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over $60. Head to oseamalibu.com and use code WISER for 10% off. This is my favorite time of year. Everything is in bloom and we get to enjoy being outside again. If you're thinking about creating the ideal outdoor living space for your home, check out Yardzin. Yardzin is the leading online landscape design and build company. Their talented team of designers and horticulturalists work one-on-one with you to create a custom design through their fully online design experience. And then they connect you to vetted contractors for a seamless end-to-end landscaping experience. Working on home projects can be really overwhelming, but Yardzin makes landscaping a breeze. You get to share photos and videos of your actual yard. Then you get to share your style preference, your budget, and how you want to live in your outdoor space. Yardzin then takes you through their tech-enabled iterative online process. You work with your designer to ultimately create an outdoor space that fits your unique property, including sun and shade patterns, slope, and soil. And you don't have to do a full upgrade either. You may just be looking for an overhaul of your plants or anything in between. Either way, Yardzin is so easy to use. Design the outdoor space that you and your family will love for years. Visit www.yarzen.com. That's Y-A-R-D-Z-E-N.com and use code WISER for $100 off any design package. That's code WISER for $100 off. Did you know you could be listening to your favorite podcasts ad-free? How great is that? Whether you listen to podcasts in the car, on your commute, or while walking the dogs, Amazon Music wants you to have a seamless experience. To listen, just download the Amazon Music app or visit amazon.com slash wiser. Amazon Music is changing the way you discover and play the podcasts you love by giving you an ad-free experience. Download the app and listen to your favorite podcasts today without the ads. 
With their catalog of music and podcasts, Amazon Music is included in your Prime membership. You might be surprised to already have access to this amazing program. With Amazon Music, you get access to the most ad-free top podcasts. Listen to your favorite podcasts ad-free with the Amazon Music app or by visiting amazon.com slash wiser. That's amazon.com slash wiser. Your big break when you were younger, younger, was with Phil Spector, right? essentially, right? Mm -hmm. But that was a double-edged sword, was it not? If you could make the sword bigger, yes. (laughs) That was a a big, big double-edged sword. (laughs) Yes, right. yes, yes, yes. And then he changed your name from Darlene Wright to Darlene Love, right? Yes. And in 1962, you recorded He's a Rebel, but your name wasn't on the record. And you knew that he had removed your name. And he did this many times. Right. How did you process the, I assume, anger that you had towards Phil and come out the other side of it? I never tried to carry hate. Now, there mm-hmm. is a big difference in hating somebody and just didn't like what they're doing to you. Mm-hmm. I think if you don't let it get, and for me, if you don't let it get into hating somebody, because hating somebody makes it only worse. Right. But I disliked what he was doing to me. But didn't you get angry? Yes, I got very angry, but it never turned into hate. I disliked him. I despised him for using me. You know, and I was always that one that would tell him, I said, you're just using me. What the hell? You know, I don't get this. I've done nothing wrong. I'm, I just want to be a singer. I want my career. And you can give me that. I think that's what I really disliked about him. He could have given me a gigantic career. And he withheld that from you. All of that. Every time I would succeed, he would be there to put his foot in the way. When I was doing television show, The producers of the TV show, man, this is the biggest show on television. It's about singers. Why don't you record, Darlene? This is nuts. This doesn't make sense. I don't, I can do, I don't want to be bothered right now with her. He would not record me the whole time I was under the contract to him while I was on Shindig. He was that foot that was always in the way. You know, like annoying something, like a f- annoying fly. I think everybody yeah. has been annoyed by the fly. You could almost like, right. if I could just, but I wouldn't let myself go to his level to hate him. I see. But I, oh, so that I was, was angry. Your, that's your superpower right there. That's your strength. It is. But I disliked every, because I wasn't, I was able, now that I really wanted a career, now I was able to get one. All you got to do is, is put the records out under my name and, and, and then make them a hit. That's what you did for the Ronettes. You did that for, for the Crystals, but you did it for the Righteous Brothers. When did you decide to to sue him? Because you did sue him. I finally did sue him because if it had not been for these, there there is a, a gentleman, his name is uh, Ruben, that he takes care of getting royalties for singers. Mm-hmm. He's here. He was here. He passed not too long ago, but he lives here. And he said, I can do this for you. I can get your royalties. But by then, I just figured I'd never want to really sue Phil Speck. Nobody wanted to take him on. Yeah, he, he was, was a huge. snake in the grass. People were scared of him. Yes. I said, that little shrimp, why are you scared of him? What can he do to you? <laughs> he could have done a lot, but I just figured what, you know. And I said, okay, let's sue him. And we sued him, and he was so shocked that I won. Wow. Because nobody has ever sued Phil Spector and won. I love that you are the one who did it. I really do. At that point, it didn't even matter about the money. Mm-hmm. Because then the no. law would only let symbol- me sue. It was for- the symbolism. That's it, right? Yeah, because the law would only let me sue for certain things, not yeah. just for the royalties. Because so my my songs were in movies, you know, that I couldn't get paid for. I'll tell you, against all odds, and here you are. I mean, I feel like I'm totally in awe of you. It, you know what? It, it's um. This business is a great business, too. It, 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 it can alleviate a lot of stress. When I'm on the stage... It's impossible, too. Yeah, oh, definitely yes. impossible. When you're on stage, everything else falls away. Am I right, Darlene? Exactly right. I can go on stage mad, and I'm mad about something, that something happened. That's why my the people around me are really great, because they won't say anything negative to me before I go on stage. 
I would hope not. But the thrill when I do a show, my greatest shows are when I'm angry. And when I get on, yeah, and when I get off the stage, the band is like, wow, who is you mad at? <laughs> really? <laughs> and it's so much fun. It's, I want my audience to feel what I'm feeling every time I'm on stage. Mm-hmm. And they come to me after show is over and things that I get on Facebook, what they say. But I, I felt like I was in your living room and you were just singing just to me. And then I go, I was. <laughs> Oh, God bless you. It's such a joy to be able to use the gift that God has given you. Mm-hmm. And believe you me, he gives it to you and he wants you to use it. Yes. He really does. I told my girlfriend the other day, I said, he shows you the beginning and he shows you the end. But he don't show you all the crap you got to go through to get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we've been talking for such a long time. I've loved every second of talking to you. I just, I really, I, 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 I'm so honored to talk to you. Let me ask you a couple other really little quick questions. Is there anything that you would tell yourself at 21? Anything that you, from this vantage point now, here you are, 81 years old. Is there something you wish your 21-year-old self had known? You know, I really do wish I, you know, you always say you wish you know back then what you know now. Yeah. But I don't think it would have happened because those are wishes and dreams. We want to be in our dream. We want to dream. We want to have wishes. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't have them, you won't appreciate life the way life is supposed to be. Right. Right. So I, I, I try not to think hard about what happened because they weren't great years for me. You know, from the age of knowing, say, 10, 15 years of age along the way, those weren't great years for me because they were trying years for me. They were trying to get over, trying to prove, mm-hmm. you know, and not just family, you know, and then you have the, the family. Th- I'm not talking about my children. I'm talking about my my brothers, my sisters, you know, mm-hmm. the church. If I would have paid attention to all of that, I would have never been who I am today. Right. Because they taught us not to be that type of person. Right. Which to me was always like, but Why? What's wrong with it? We don't all have to be nuts to be in this business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't have to fall in the traps. Right. And you didn't. You know, I've been, I've been taught, and I thank God for all those learnings that I learned back that we didn't, because the traps was there. I mean, forget Las Vegas. I mean, there was so many opportunities to be a bad girl <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. do all the things to really where you think this is what I really want. I want to have money. I want right. a man. I want power. I want fine houses and all of that. Yeah. No. Those are trappings. What's the best business advice that you ever received? Hmm. I can always go back to Dion. Tell me. The best advice she ever gave me is like, you know, she called me Doll. My nickname was Dolly. Doll. Whatever it is you want to do, you just have to, you have to find a way to do it. Just do it. There's no miracle. There is no special something. You know what I mean? You just believe you can do it, and you, and you do it. And I, it's, that's proven over time because whenever I got stuck, I would always say, I can do this. It's not too hard for me to do this. I can get over this. I can do it. I will do this. Yeah. I will do this. Mm-hmm. This has been the most joyful conversation, and you are an inspiration to me and to everybody in the world. I can confidently say that. Thank you for being here, and I give you my love, and thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. It has been a wonderful time with you. God bless. God bless you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Well, how much fun was that? <laughs> oh, there's so much to tell my mom. I'm going to Zoom her right now. Hello. Hi. hi, Mom. Hi, sweet. There you are. Oh, you went away. Come back. There you are. Now you're muted. How can I be muted? No, no, now I can hear you. <laughs> now I can hear you. <laughs> so, hi, Mommy. So, I just ended a conversation with Darlene Love. and. She is the a very remarkable person. I saw her in the um, you know the, the backup singer uh, 
Uh, yes, 20 feet from stardom. Exactly, 20, 20 feet. I never can remember how many feet, but <laughs> the, the backup singers, they just struck me as being so remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. She said when she's on stage, everything just falls away. I kind of got that. You know what I mean? For me, that's exactly the same too. You know, when the engine is really firing, everything definitely falls away. But I have to tell a story about myself. I don't know if I've ever actually told you this. So uh, back in the 80s, I was in this Woody Allen movie, Hannah and Her Sisters. I had a very small role. Mm -hmm. I played a production assistant on Woody Allen's show. This is within the film. And he was like the director or the showrunner or something. And I was a production assistant. And we're shooting a scene in which Woody Allen thinks that he has a brain tumor and he thinks he's hearing things. Mm -hmm. But he's also the director of the film, by the way. And so we roll camera. I'm supposed to cross the camera, which means walk across the set. And then Woody says, wait a minute, does anybody hear that? That was the line he was supposed to say. And so we did it, and they roll camera, and they go, action. I start to walk across, and Woody goes, wait a minute, and I stop my tracks. <laughs> 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 and I go, yeah, what? And he goes, no, 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 that's the line. And I go, oh, my God, you can imagine. I mean, Mom, I was like, I was oh. like 23 years old when this happened. I was like so humiliated, and everybody laughed. And so we go back to one, roll camera, action. I start to cross. Woody goes, wait a minute. And I stopped in my tracks again. I did it again a second time. <laughs> I did. So talk about things falling away. I mean, that was an experience where I was just completely – out of my mind being in this movie. But you know, let me tell you something, but you got to laugh. I got to laugh. It wasn't and a good one though, mom. It wasn't a good one. You no, know, I know it wasn't, but let me tell you, when you were four and you were in your dance class and everybody was, when I got to look through the little window, the little circular window on the door, because we couldn't go in, the moms couldn't go in. We took turns looking. So um, when I was looking, you were going, run, run, the class was going, run, 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 leap, run, 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 leap. And so you kept, your turn came and you went, run, leap, run, leap. Mm. Everybody started to laugh. <laughs> you liked it. You liked it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, whatever your world was. Yeah, but you, I, you I will in. tell you, Woody Allen made a joke at my expense after that. I can't remember what he did, but he said some comment about how I kept screwing it up and every, and, and then he got a laugh. So um, it wasn't yeah. quite the happiest ending ever. But anyway. This woman has had a remarkable life. I'm so happy that you, I'm so happy that you, you had a chance to talk to her and that uh, that she was uh, uh, that you got the sort of arc of her life. Yeah, such remarkable women that you have been in touch with, and and each of these is goes in like a pet pill. <laughs> a what pill? <laughs> a pet <laughs> pet pill. No, you know what I mean. In other words, and when I feel old and tired and so forth, and you know, but, but then you get sense of other people's lives being so adventuresome and energetic, and it's like, oh yeah, come on, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, that's what I mean by a pet pill. I mean we can we can do that for each other, but I think that these these women must have inner strength that is practiced. Yeah, she's squeezing every. <laughs> ounce out of life that she can. Oh, God to, bless her. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad. It's good news in just the right way. Yeah, I know. So go listen to some Darlene Love music. And oh, I'm going to do that in mead, in mead. So okay. um, anyway, uh, thank you, Lovey, for doing this. I'm so happy that you're garnering all this wisdom, and I hope you're keeping notes. <laughs> I'm trying to keep notes, but we have transcripts, yes. so we can just read the transcripts. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, mommy, I'm going to jump off. Okay. I love you so much. Keep up the good work. Toodaloo. Toodaloo. There's more Wiser Than Me with Lemonada Premium. Subscribers get exclusive access to bonus content. Subscribe now in Apple Podcasts. Wiser Than Me is a production of Lemonada Media, created and hosted by me, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. The show is produced by Chrissy Pease, Alex McOwen, and Oha Lopez. Brad Hall is a consulting producer. 
Our senior editor is Tracy Clayton. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paula Kaplan, and me. The show is mixed by Kat Yore and Johnny Vince Evans, and music by Henry Hall. Special thanks to Charlotte Chrisman Cohen and, of course, my mother, Judith Bowles. Follow Wiser Than Me wherever you get your podcasts. And hey, if there's an old lady in your life, listen up. 